so last time we stopped here and we were talking about orthonormal sets, but really we were talking, more importantly, it was to get to the point of a uh, orthonormal basis, right? It's a set, but the purpose is it's a basis for a span, and I want things that are orthogonal and then of length one. And so those particular things, what was nice about it is the, the least squares problem had a solution of x hat is equal to a transpose a inverse times a transpose b, and then the projection, which is in the range of a, is simply going to be a times a transpose a inverse a transpose b. And one way I could look at this is to take all of that right there and call it a single matrix, okay, say capital P, and then little p is equal to capital P b, and this thing, this capital B is called the projection matrix of B onto the range of A. And so it, this matrix, which is this A times A transpose A all being inverse times A transpose, that is a single matrix, is going to take a B and map it onto the range of A and find the P closest to B. Right, and so what this has done is this matrix, so P maps B onto the range of A and gives this P closest to B. That's what this least squares problem does. What's nice about this is this particular problem becomes a lot simpler if A itself would have been orthonormal, right? And so if A was, all the internal uh, column vectors were orthogonal and normal, then A transpose A is the identity, the identity inverse is the identity, and then it's just A, A transpose when, when, when I look at this particular thing. So this particular problem reduces down rather nicely. But more importantly, it's the fact that, hey, there is something that projects a B not in the range into the range. And we're going to use that idea and try to do something similar. So let's say that I have a problem and I have a subspace. So S is a subspace. I have a vector, B. So S is any subspace. Now, before when I was looking at it as solving the least squares problem, this was the range of A, but this is any subspace. And this will be important because we can generate subspaces in other vector spaces by just forming spans, right? I can look at this and say, hey, I have a span of these objects, and that will be a subspace. So let's say that you have a subspace, and it's going to be so V is our vector space. S is a subspace, and it has a width a orthonormal basis that's been given to you, and that's U1, U2, up to UK. We can take a variation or the idea behind the least squares problem and say, is there going to be a vector, say, P, such that P minus B is in S's orthogonal complement? If that's true, then P is going to be the thing in the subspace closest to B that is in the vector space. Which is exactly what the least squares problem was. 
And I'll think about a variation. This, if V is continuous functional space, that means vectors themselves are just continuous functions. Now, there's certain things that we know about continuous functions. Uh, the exponential function, the logarithm function, the sine function, the cosine function have names. If you've had your calculus book, what's the title of your calculus book? It's calculus for here. It's calculus and called early transcendentals. You ever wondered why it's called early transcendentals? I mean early. Early just simply says, in this class, we're going to introduce to you the transcendental functions early. We tend to do it at the beginning. Sometimes in calculus, they'll deal with the non-transcendental functions but then do the transcendentals. Well, what's a transcendental? Um, mathematically, there's only certain things we can do. If I ask you to calculate stuff, you can add, you can multiply, and really multiplication is addition. Exponentiation is multiplication. Division is multiplication. It's a question of multiplication. Subtraction is undoing addition. So those are things you can do. But there are objects that transcend that. So if I ask you to calculate the exponential, like e to the fifth power. All right, you could not find e to the fifth power using normal addition, subtraction, multiplication, division with a fixed number of times. In other words, oh, if I add this and multiply this number and divide this number and take this power of number and take the nth root of this number, I'll get the answer. That's impossible. You have to do an infinite number of those things to get to this particular thing. So those functions transcend the stuff that we can actually do, which is kind of an interesting question if I ask you to find e to the fifth. If e to the fifth transcends things that you can actually physically do, how do I get it? Because you put it into a calculator, something comes out. So where did it come from? It comes from this. What can you do? Polynomial stuff. Really what you can do is polynomials. I can add and I can multiply because subtraction division is that. Exponents, that's multiply. Those are things I can do with numbers. Give me any number, I can add it and I can multiply it. Well, what we do is we take a subspace. And the subspace is, hey, these are all the polynomial functions I'm interested in. Those are the things I can actually do. But obviously, the exponential transcends that. So what I want to find is a polynomial that is as close as possible to that transcendental. So when you plug in something into your calculator, it does not do the exponential. It does a polynomial such that the error is as small as possible. And it's an error, more importantly, that we can actually discuss. It's within so many decimal places. Well, if you only needed 5 and I gave you within 10, we'll consider that good. And so that's how you come up with these particular numbers. And so the least squares problem, which used to be an actual physical vector to this vector and solving this least squares data fitting, right? That idea can be applied to any vector space, any subspace. How do I do this? The important part of solving this problem is going to be the orthonormal basis. My subspace, if it has an orthonormal basis, becomes a really, really nice solution. In other words, if I want to find the thing in my subspace, this is as closest to P as B as possible, here's theorem 5.5, simply says this. So, we have B, it's in our vector space. We have this orthonormal basis, U sub i's. Then, hey, the projection P written as how many U1's plus how many U2's plus everything up to how many UK's. Really what I'm talking about is can you find the, the coordinates and basis U, the orthonormal basis, within the subspace that tells you what P is. And the theorem simply is this. Those coordinates are just simply the inner product between B and the orthonormal basis. If this is true, then P minus B is in S's orthogonal complement. We found the thing as close as possible. 
So what does that tell you about finding P as close as to B as I want? All you have to do is figure out if you're given an orthonormal basis, we can go ahead and figure out the linear combination of those orthonormal vectors to spit out the thing that's as close as possible. So back to a straightforward example. E to the X could be approximately how many P1s plus how many P2s plus how many P3s, where I'm going to use the orthonormal polynomials that I did before, which was P1 was uh, 1 over radical 2. And P2 was equal to do, 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 radical 3 halves x. And then P3 is equal to radical 5 eighths times 3x squared minus 1. Now, if I would find so many constants, so many x's, and so many x, 3x squareds minus 1, radical, you know, this here, Really, what am I doing? If I use this one, this is a constant, this is a linear, this is a quadratic. What am I approximating e to the x by? A parabola. I'm going to find the parabola that is as close to possible for e to the x on, what, the continuous functions from minus 1 to 1, where the inner product is defined as the integral from negative 1 to 1 of fg dx. And then all I have to do is figure out, well, what's the linear combination? Well, to find those, what's c1? It's just going to be uh, what is e to the x with p1, which is 1 over radical 2. So I have to integrate from negative 1 to 1 of 1 over radical 2 e to the x dx which we can approximate. And then what's C2? It's e to the x with this radical 3 halves x, which is the integral from minus 1 to 1, of radical 3 halves x e to the x dx. And then C3 is going to be e to the x. And then radical 5 eighths times 3x squared minus 1 which is equal to the integral from minus 1 to 1 of radical 5 eighths times 3x squared minus 1 e to the x dx. And you look at this sort of stuff and say, well, how does that make my problem any better? What I'm trying to do is replace e to the x with a polynomial that is as close as possible. Um, definite integrals calculate areas. Definite integrals can be evaluated by you could use the trapezoid rule, you can use Simpson's rule, you can get however much accuracy you want. Eventually, I want a decimal number, a decimal number, a decimal number, and then I could figure out that as a decimal, and that as a decimal, and that as a decimal. Get however much decimal accuracy you want, and I will get a constant, so many x, so many x squared. Right? If I would multiply this entire thing out, if you do all of this work by hand and you spend the time, what you'll find eventually is a e to the x is approximately some sort of a plus bx plus cx squared, where these are found by evaluating the above stuff. And what you'll see, and you actually plot this, what you'll find is between minus 1 to 1, and there's a 1 right there, this is e to the x. And what you'll find is an approximate polynomial that's as close as possible, and this would be a parabola that's as close as possible of e to the x as you can get. The error is going to be minimum. So if I can't do e to the x between negative 1 and 1, use that parabola. So just spend some work, evaluate it, you have a fixed function that from now on you use. And we can actually use something like this to actually evaluate things like, well, if it only works, this is supposed to be between negative 1 and 1, what if it's e to the 100th power? That's not between negative 1 and 1. 
but you can use a fact of, well, e to the 100 is actually e to the 50 squared. But e to the 50 is what? e to the 25 squared squared. Anybody know what squaring does in binary systems? You can play around with things like that. Taking square roots and squares, if you keep doing this, eventually you'll get down to a number between negative 1 and 1, which you could approximate, and then just keep squaring it, and squaring it back out, which is a straightforward binary operation, becomes, all right, there's my answer. Works out rather quickly. So we can use properties of algebra to evaluate things using functions that we can do for functions that we cannot do. So really what we're trying to do is figure out, so for all of this stuff, it ends up being that it ends up really nice if you have an inner product space. You can project anything onto a subspace as long as the stuff that you're projecting it on is what? Orthonormal. Then how do I find the coefficients? Inner product, inner product, inner product. Take the time for the inner products. You can find those coefficients. A classic example is this, projecting transcendentals onto polynomials. Another classic example is a different inner product space. And it's what we call the Fourier transform. The Fourier transform says what I'm going to study is I'm going to have functions of x that are not I'm not interested in the transcendentals because I'm going to actually use a transcendental. Um, what I'm interested in, what I believe is a function that tends to be periodic. It's some sort of oscillating event. And so some sort of periodic function. If you have an oscillating function, it's oscillating, and you say it has a particular period, you can always take a oscillating function, let's say it oscillates between negative 100 and a million. If it's oscillating, it's oscillating. What you could do is just simply multiply the, you could do a horizontal shift and stretching to take this thing and compress it to between minus pi and pi. Right? What you could do is you could stretch it until it's 2 pi wide and then move it over until it fits minus pi to pi. It's the same thing. So I can do a straightforward linear transform of squeezing it or stretching it and then moving it until it fits between minus pi and pi. So that would mean that any periodic function could be, could be considered part of, by simple, tr by linear transform, this could be moved into C minus pi to pi. So continuous functional face be space between minus pi to pi, and we're going to use the inner product space where I'm going to use FG with the weighted norm 1 over pi, the integral from minus pi to pi, fg dx. Not the weighted norm, the weighted inner product. So I'm using this inner product space. And I only want, I'm, what I'm really interested in is anything that seems to be oscillatory, which would be flat out what? Pretty much most signals you listen to, right? When you listen to things, it's like, oh, look, it's, it's sound, you know. It's pretty much it's oscillating, right? So you could consider it periodic like. You know, you can actually say what's the period? When did the sound start and when did the sound end? That's its period. It's oscillating. Then what happens? It repeats. Well, what if it doesn't repeat? Well, that's a new function. It's another piece what we'll, we'll we'll take that function and analyze it. And so you just simply say once it start, once it's end, that's its period. We'll stretch this thing between minus pi and pi. Why do we do this? Is because, well, what do we need? I am going to have all of these functions, so that's my vector space V, it's my inner product space. And so I have my function, say F, but what is my subspace? My subspace is going to be the span of, and the important part is, orthonormal. And what's the orthonormal thing that I'm going to use? 1 over radical 2, sine x, cosine x, sine 2x cosine 2x, sine nx, cosine nx. Two n plus one functions. I'm going to fit this with 
a nice group of stuff that oscillates. And so what's supposed to happen? What's supposed to happen is I'm supposed to have so many of these, so many of these. Now, a constant times sine x, what does that do to it? Put a constant out in front of a sine, what does it do? Changes its amplitude. So what I'll be finding is, well, if I need this sine, and it needs to be this amplitude because it's a signal that I'm processing, it'll find the amplitude of that particular thing. What's the difference of that versus, say, for example, some other constant times sine nx? Well, that changes the amplitude, but what does the n do? What's the period of sine x? That's a 2 pi period. In other words, it oscillates once in right, my frame of reference. I'm saying I have one oscillation between when I first start looking and when I end looking. What does this one say? What's its period? It's 2 pi over n period, which means it oscillates how many times? n. So what I'm asking for is what's the combination of waves that when I add them up will cause different things where certain one of these will be important, certain ones won't, and they'll be either fast oscillations to slow oscillations, what's the linear combination, and guess what? These are all orthonormal. So if they're all orthonormal, how do I find their coefficients? Straightforward inner product. So this is my orthonormal set that I use. The way this is normally written is to say, hey, the function of x that you're studying can be approximated by a trigonometric tn. Why is it called tn? It's a bunch of trig functions up to sine n, cosine n, x, which would be how many oscillations that you want. And then, well, what is that? The way this is normally written is to say that we don't use, all right, what happens here is if you would take f versus 1 over radical 2, if you added another 1 over radical 2 to this, it would be, because this is an integral, right? The 1 over radical 2 would slip in, that would become 1 half. So finding the inner product between f and 1 over radical 2 is the same as finding the inner product between f and 1, but half of that. And so what happens is we don't use the one of radical two. We say we're going to look for uh, something times a half plus all the trigs. Well, how do I handle all the trigs? Well, I'll just simply say sum from k equal one to n. It'll be, hey, what are the constants that are involving the cosines of kx? And then what are the constants involving the sines of kx? And that, that, this just sucks them all up. So the A's are the ones that are associated with the cosines. The B's are the ones associated with the sines. The A0 is associated with that guy. But we're taking advantage of that constant 1 over radical 2. And the way that you find all of these is how do I find A0? I take my function with 1 rather than 1 over radical 2. And then half of it, it ends up being the same thing. And then AK from here on out is I need to do an inner product with f and the cosine of kx, and the bk's are found by taking the inner product of f and the sine of kx. But what's the inner product? That. So how do I find all of these constants? I find all of these constants by doing a bunch of integrals. But once I find all those integrals, what have I really found? I found the amplitude of every one of these. Does that make sense? I found the amplitude for sine. I found the amplitude for sine 2x. I found the amplitude for sine 3x. All right, normally the thing on the inside is called, it's a period shift, which tells you it oscillates k times, which normally you say things like it's its frequency. So what would you do if you had, most of the amplitudes are all zero, except for one, particular amplitude exists. Well, that one particular amplitude will be associated with what? A frequency. And so when you find these, you would simply realize, oh, wait a second. I'm finding frequency combinations of these periodic signals. If the amplitude is zero, it says that frequency is basically not here. If the amplitude is here, 
then you would say, oh, that frequency actually has an amplitude. It's involved. And so this is, an analyza this is analyzing different problems. Now, I could write this with the book goes through it. There's several things you could finish off. More importantly, it's just once you have this, this is what Fourier analysis is. It's find the amplitudes. And by the way, if the amplitude's not zero, the, the sine or cosine that it's associated with is here. So its frequency matters. Is everybody okay with that? All right. And so it's just a least squared problem, and it ends up being rather easy to do as long as we have orthonormal bases. And this is a big chunk of approximations because we have lots of functions that we cannot actually find. They exist in such a way that they can't be computationally found or even done. So we find things as close as possible to them within an understood error. Can you start to see why you know, ideas like this can be used for compression algorithms? Instead of storing all the data, just store the coefficients. right? Because with it, the order of the coefficients tells you which frequency that you're doing. And then if you do that, if you know the coefficients and its order, this is approximately, this is the true sound. This, which is really just simply store those numbers, will recreate as close as possible the real sound. You've compressed it. You need a million sample points. Well, if I only want to go to whatever frequencies, sample these frequencies, find those numbers, I can only store those numbers and it will recreate the sound in, within a particular approximation. Of course, you throw this away and you've compressed your data. <laughs>